One way of doing is to looking at the impacts that we might characterize as defining sustainability. So this is kind of a spider chart. A lot of you have seen this, and you kind of use it as a way to rate how well you're doing along the degree of a number of different metrics. Uh, the further out you are on the spider chart, the better. And if you take an existing design, for example, for you name it, a, a PC or a laptop or a package for a, for a, for some uh, you know, uh, consumer product or an automobile or a lawnmower, you can define along many different axes. And the axes we define are things like greenhouse gases, water use, uh, societal impact, materials use, uh, economic value and cost, uh, you know, return on investment, energy use. Is it recyclable? Is it reusable? Are there environmental impacts or, or things that are doing on with our design based upon its use or its manufacture that we would, would not be happy about? And we would hope that if we think about all these features, in fact, we move that spider chart elements out as much as possible towards a better level. That is, we have a, a better social responsibility as a result of the product. We use less water or use water more efficiently. We have less greenhouse gas impact, less environmental impact. Our product or our materials are more recyclable. We use less energy. Uh, we, but, but we don't sacrifice the economic value. In fact, if anything, we improve upon our return on investment so we have a better business model as well as a sustainability model. Now, the way I've characterized this is something that um, I use a lot. <clears throat> Students get tired of seeing this, but it's a very convenient sort of a cartoon that talks a bit about how we want to do this. If you plot the rate of consumption or impact these days, so whether it's energy or oil consumption or impact such as global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, most of the curves go from lower left to upper right and in a bad direction. So things generally increase in growth. The impacts are generally a function of population, the, uh, for example, GDP per person, and then the impact per unit of GDP. So even if you are doing a great job, for example, California has a, a per capita energy use that's been relatively flat over the last couple of decades because of regulations and, and, and ways in which appliances and, and heating and energy use in, in domestic uh, and industrial environments are, have been stabilized. But just because we have more people, we use more energy. So you can't just simply stabilize one aspect. You've got to think about the entire, the entire piece. So in fact, if you make a few improvements, you increase, you twiddle with the, uh, the process a little bit, increase efficiency, you can lower that curve. But unfortunately, the curve keeps moving up and to the right. We can define a sustainable rate of impact or consumption, not easily in many cases, but you can approximate it for most things that we're concerned about. For example, water use in an area. You know how much water is in your, in your water shed, shed, so if you use water at a greater rate than it is replenished, you are not at a sustainable rate. Uh, the environment has an ability to absorb CO2 and other sort of uh, effluents at a certain rate, so we know what that rate is. So making some small improvements is helpful, but we really need to close this huge gap to turn that curve around, to bend the curve back towards asymptotically approaching a sustainable rate. It's going to take a long time. And the question is, how do we do that? The answer is little wedges. A couple of uh, researchers from Princeton University, Sokolov and Pakov, came up with a very interesting idea a few years ago on technology wedges. So rather than having a single uh, silver bullet, we should take this gap that's shown between the red line and the green line and divide it up into small wedges of technology that can help reduce that. And there's a number of ideas. There's energy efficiency. There's sustainable energy. There's, there's a carbon sequestration. There's alternate business methods, et cetera, et cetera. So when we're done, this impact and consumption curve bends back towards sustainability by the application of clever small wedges of technology. And the only curve that's left going up and to the right should be our profit. Okay, our return on our investment. We don't want to impact that. We want to keep that going up, but we want to keep these other sustainability characteristics reaching a sustainable rate. That's not easy, but it's going to happen over time. And we're talking in this conversation about how to, how to think about doing that in terms of your manufacturing operation. So let's look a little bit then at the end on green manufacturing, which was the title of the whole presentation in the first place. And what are the reasons and what are some, some methods to, to address some of those kinds of things? The first question is, why should industry care? There's a number of excellent reasons. If you haven't sort of caught the drift of it by now, I'm just going to reiterate those just to make sure that they're perfectly clear. 
first of all, and this is not any particular order of importance, uh, there's a strong pull from customers. You know, data is showing that customers are becoming more aware of environmental impacts, carbon footprints, et cetera, of products. They're being pushed to do this in the European Union and other places where this is a hot topic. They're aware of it in other parts of the world as well. If for no other reason than reduced energy consumption or reduced costs. Secondly, there's a strong pull from the marketplace. People like to be considered the first people into the market. They want to base their reputation or guarantee their reputation. They don't want to get whacked like Sony was with these uh, PlayStation problems a couple of years ago where they found they had cadmium in their in the cables that were connecting them and they didn't realize that happened and they had to pull their product off the market. So you want to maintain your market share, you want to maintain your leadership, you want to sustain that, you want to be considered as a very advantageous uh, leader of the market. Not trivially, there's a push from governments and, regu and regions in terms of regulations, penalties, and tax benefits. The regulations coming out of the European Union, discussions going on in the U.S. Congress in terms of greenhouse gas. California, AB 32, Global Warming Solutions Act, regulating greenhouse gas to uh, levels so that by 2020 we should be at 1990 levels. This is going to have an impact on how you do business and how your product is seen as fitting into whether you meet these regulations or you don't. And there'll be feedback in terms of uh, perhaps penalties or regulations or restrictions on the way you do business. It's just good business practice, right? Continuous, uh, continuous improvement, reduce uh, use of, uh, of materials and resources, considered to be a long time good business practice. It also substantially reduces your risk and exposure to things that you may not have control of in the supply chain, energy availability, water, if water is an important part of your product, uh, materials in the supply chain, such as the Sony example I mentioned, uh, scarcity of materials, transport limitations and restrictions, a number of things that really are substantially related to your ability to do business the way you'd like to, uh, and you want to be able to understand what risks or exposure you have to those things as it affects the environmental impacts. There's a strong push from society. We can all see this. Uh, Non-governmental organizations are very active in this. And maybe last but not least, your competitor. It's kind of not good if your competitor figures this out and gains all of the kind of things we've talked about earlier in terms of the market recognition, and you're not doing that. So we want to keep a head up over the horizon to see what's going on, and we want to make sure that you can take advantage of these things. The jumps that occurred previously um, from uh, uh, by Ford and, and Taylor and uh, Merchant and others gave those companies that introduced those things tremendous competitive advantage in building market share. Let's not uh, let's pay attention to this last jump and make sure that we take advantage of it and be one of the, the strong competitors, not one of the, the level three uh, surprised by what happens I talked about before. In addition, there's a lot of really interesting uh, things that happen as a manufacturer. You're a lot more responsive to your customers. Your process continues to improve and lean. Uh, innovation always leads to better products and services under, uh, under uh, well-implemented processes. Importantly, you reduce your cost of ownership. Uh, increase efficiency. Those are important features that everybody is concerned about. 